All right. <clears throat> so I thought last week's discussion was really powerful. Not last week, two weeks ago, since we were last in session. And so we moved from the primeval history. And at the very end of chapter 11, when we switched into a historical setting, we were told the lineage of Abraham and that we now had a female in the genealogy and we're told that this female was barren. And this idea of barrenness was supposed to be writ large. So we have this whole creation story. What does it look like when we are in perfect harmony with our creator? Well, clearly the reality of the world is it doesn't look like that. There is murder and deceit and humans in conflict with one another and with the creator. And so when it comes to this place of barrenness, of uncertainty, of no idea what the future has in store, what do you do? And then we come into the historical moment where it is this God of the universe, the creator God, is actually a God that is in relationship with the individual and that this God speaks a promise into the midst of the barrenness. And then we have this historical figure, Abraham and Abraham's spouse, Sarah, who received this promise, but they received the promise in the midst of the barrenness with no evidence that the promise is ever going to come to fruition. They're already in their old age, past the age of fertility. They have no land. They're told to leave their land. Everything seems as if it is not going to come to pass, that the barrenness will continue. The promise is false, that there is no hope. We talked a lot last time about how the promise to Abraham and Sarah is not meant just for them, but the final part of the blessing is, oh, by the way, you are blessed so that you can be a blessing to others. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see that play out in the midst of this story of Abraham. And so our final piece of the scripture last time we were together was the foray into Egypt. Um, and we're getting two stories that are kind of juxtaposed together, um, the story of the foray into Egypt, and then what we'll read today, that is Abraham trying to parse out what does it mean that his own life um, can be part of the blessing and the curse of how he lives out his own life. So he goes into Egypt. He doesn't necessarily trust that he'll be protected. He's worried that he's going to be murdered in order for someone to take his wife, Sarah. So he comes up with this lie that Sarah is actually his sister. And then the result is that Pharaoh becomes cursed by God. And so here's a story where not believing in the promise results in cursing, curses for the rest of humanity. Um, but now we're going to get a story where perhaps believing in the promise actually results in blessings for people outside of Abraham's own circle. So chapter 13. Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with him into the Negev. So this is our wilderness area. Now, Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. He journeyed on by stages from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. There's something personal about this God that the God's name can be spoken and known and called upon. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, and the land could not support both of them living together because their possessions were so great that they could not live together. Thus strife arose between the herders of Abram's livestock and the herders of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites lived in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herders and my herders, for we are kindred. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right, or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. Lot looked about him and saw the plain of the Jordan was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the plain of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward, and they separated from each other. Abram settled into the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the plain and moved his tent as far as Sodom. All right, we'll pause there for a moment. Um, what do you notice about these negotiations between Abram and Lot? 
Well, it's handled very differently than the dispute between Cain and Abel. Mm, absolutely. So Chris says handled very differently than the dispute between Cain and Abel. What do you see as the differences here? Well, they figure things out. They figure things out. There's no murder here. That's a big difference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Diane is noticing that it's um, out of cultural character for the elder or senior person to provide the choice to the younger person. And I think that's intentional in this story that Abram is trusting that even if the land is not big enough now for the two of them, that giving the choice to Lot will still allow the promise of, of a land and a home for him to come to fruition, even if he's not the one choosing it. So that is absolutely something of note that he gives the choice to Lot. Lot takes the choice. Abram takes whatever Lot does not choose. Again, trusting that that promise that has no evidence will come to pass, even if Lot chooses the land first. And the result is, instead of Pharaoh being cursed, it is that Lot is blessed. Lot has enough herds and tents and possessions that he gets his own land as well. Uh, most likely what's happening in this story is we're still, even though we've gone out of the primeval history into a more historical context, we're still going to get what are these etiologies? How does something come to exist? How does something get named? And so the Israelites are probably wondering, how is it that this group that is not necessarily us, but closely related to us, these Canaanites, these Perizzites, how are they in land that we possess um, and we're okay with it? Well, these are the descendants of Lot who was related to Abram. And so that's why they have this land. So that's probably what's going on here historically. Any other notes or comments about this interaction between Abram and Lot? Yeah. Not so much between them, but you could just point it out that uh, in Egypt, Abram was not trusting God to protect him. And so he had the power to pretend to be his sister. And then here, he's trusting that even if Lot chooses, yeah yeah absolutely beautifully said so diana is saying now here we have abram trusting that even if lot chooses first that he'll still have what he needs in um, juxtaposition to the story of not trusting God in Egypt and reflecting that that's very much the experience of our own faith or the faith of the disciples that sometimes we feel like we have all the faith that we need. Sometimes we recognize that we're lacking faith and that we're full of a lot of doubt. I think that is just so beautifully said because the folks who are putting these stories together, putting them side by side, there is no commentary added to say, well, Abram failed here, or Abram got it right here. It's just a narrative description of the life of Abram, where this is what it's like. This is what it looks like to try to trust the promises. Sometimes you don't, sometimes you do. Uh, and that's the way it is. That's faith, that's life. Yeah, that was great. What is the relationship of the Canaanites and the Perizzites to the <clears throat> Yeah, so we, we've had this attempt at trying to explain kind of the origin of the Canaanites and the Perizzites, um, that anytime we get a story where there's kind of a breaking off of the family line, that some of these Canaanites are relatives of Cain and not Abel, and then we got it to where some of these Canaanites are the descendants of Hem from Noah and not Jepheth or Shem, or Jepheth specifically is the line of the Israelites. So um, these are all kind of attempts to explain where they came from, um, but they're just kind of, you know, genetically, ethnically, these groups are all very similar to each other. Canaanites, Perizzites, Edomites, Aramites, 
all these people groups who are getting Jebusites. Um, they're all living in the land. They're all very similar to each other. They're just kind of breaking off and creating their own clans, their own tribes, their own people. If that makes sense. I mean, we see that historically in lots of different well, yeah, regions. What's the real, I mean, I don't know. Are they the inhabitants of the land and Lot and Abraham are uh, interlopers? Yes. Yes. So the question was, are, are they already inhabiting the land and they're going into their land? That answer is, is definitely yes. Okay. Now the people of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, raise your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. And I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, then your offspring can also be counted. Rise up and walk the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. All right. So we have another promise of the land here in Genesis 13. We had a promise in Genesis 12. When we get to Genesis 15, the promise is going to be reiterated, a reminder of what is to come. Um, you know, we've paused a lot as we're getting into these texts to just kind of understand the problematic nature of these land promises as they're lived out today, that folks can kind of point to these texts and say the divine promise still exists that the descendants of Abraham are to own this land. Um, and so in a geopolitical sense, these texts are at play um, and problematic. But the promise is to to Abram here, that the land will come to him and to his offspring. Is, is it fair to say that because over the time of history, they kept the land when they were able to through combat, that that is still the philosophy then? What's the question? That um, so through words, God promising the land, but it's not like there was this magic wall so that no one came in. So they were oh. divinely attacked. <laughs> And their way of maintaining the promise basically was through combat. Is that what still the philosophy? Maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. People using these. Yeah. Verses? Yeah, definitely. So Shirley's question is: you, you, Here's a promise that is believed and held on to. There's no magic wall to keep people from entering the land. And so, is the belief that fighting wars is a way to preserve the land? Yeah, that's how it would be said. Mm -hmm. Definitely. The enemies of God. We're talking about the land that is in war right now, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but just religiously speaking, who is fighting for the land? The Muslims and the Jews, right? Well, um, it's not necessarily a religious war because <coughs> Palestinians. Right, I understand that. Yeah. Those the people who are fighting are. Jews and Muslims, right? And Christians. And Christians. I'm sorry, but those are all descendants of Abraham. And those are all descendants What's of Abraham. <laughs> I get your point. I get, thank you for leading us there. Um, so Wendy's point is, like, all these folks are the descendants of Abraham, the Jews, the Christians, the Muslims. So how do you, um, what's the problem? How can we not coexist in the land? Yeah, absolutely great point. That this promise comes to Abram, and all of these faiths trace their lineage to Abram. So, I assume that uh, <coughs> today's Palestinian, or I mean the Israel and the Jews, who are very strongly that Israel should control all of that. So, we come back to the scripture in which God says that He yeah, Diane said there, we come back to this, say it's your offspring forever as justification for I can control it. Definitely. Um, and then this clash between religion and you know, geopolitics of, well, what are 
the boundaries of that land because what exists today is not what Abram would have understand understood. It's not what King David would have understood or the height of the boundaries under Solomon. Um, and so very complicated. Yeah, Robin. Absolutely. So it, he didn't say you're Jewish. I mean, there was no Jewish thing. Yeah. But, yeah. But <clears throat> I don't know. I, I, I hadn't really ever read about it. Yeah. Um, Robin making just a really great point that it says to your offspring forever. And the Muslims trace their lineage to Ishmael, the offspring of Abram. It doesn't say only your Jewish offspring, which doesn't even exist as a concept yet. Um, definitely. And we talked a lot in our last session about how, okay, well, the blessing, you know, if this promise has eternal validity, <laughs> as argued, well, the promise is blessed to be a blessing. Um, and so how does that get lived out in a modern context? Did I see a hand over here as well? No, okay. Well, we're praising Lot and Abraham for working out their disagreement, obviously. Yeah, they've created a two-state solution <laughs> where both can peacefully coexist in the land. Yeah, maybe that's a good model. Um, yeah, the history of the state of Israel and how it was formed and is so complicated and involves so much politics. The whole Palestinian mandate from the 40s, it's... I mean, it's American and UK colonialism having its effects to this day. I mean, clearly, anti-Semitism is real. The attempted extermination of the Jewish people is real. The idea of a safe Jewish homeland makes sense, but not as it exists today, where people are being pushed out of land that they've inhabited for centuries, murdered, starved. Blessed to be a blessing. All right. Uh, we're going to get a very strange story um, in 14 before we get to 15. Two strange stories, actually. So uh, let us get through all these words. In the days of King Amraphel of Shinar, King Arioch of Elisar, King Sherdeleomer of Elam, and King Tidal of Goyim, um, you might recognize this word, just Gentiles. These kings made war with King Bera of Sodom, King Bersha of Gomorrah, King Shinab of Adma, King Shemabar of Zeboyim, and the King of Bela, that is Zoar. All these joined forces in the Valley of Siddim, that is the Dead Sea. Twelve years they had served, shared a Leomar, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Shador Leomar and the kings who were with him came and subdued the Rephaim and Ashtaroth Karnaim, the Zuzim and Ham, the Amim and Sheva, Kirathaim, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran on the edge of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and subdued all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who lived in Hazazon Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomor, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and they joined battle in the valley of Siddam with King Shador Leomer of Elam, King Tidal of Goyim, King Amraphil of Shinar, and King Arioch of Elisar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddam was full of bitumen pits, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who lived in Sodom and his goods, and departed. Good morning. All right, so all that to say... Um, even these Canaanites are not monolithic. There are a lot of different people groups within this umbrella of the Canaanites. They're at war with each other. Just your common conflict, your common war taking place. And Lot, who's living in Sodom, is um, abducted. 
All right. The one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eschol and of Aner, that these were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his nephew had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and routed them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the goods and also brought back his nephew Lot with his goods and the women and the people. All right. This is a common narrative genre of the adventure story. So anytime you have a hero within these cultures, you want to tell stories about their exploits, about their victories, about their adventures. And so we're going to get that within the book of Judges. We're going to get that within the historical books of, you know, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings. Anytime you have a hero, King David, before he becomes king is a great soldier. So with Saul, you're going to get these stories of their exploits and their heroics. And so Abram is within that line. Here he is a hero of the faith. And so they're going to assign to him this heroic adventurous story that he goes and saves Lot um, along with his fighting men from being kidnapped in Sodom. Questions or comments about that one? All right. After his return from the defeat of Sherdor Leomer and the kings who are with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. And King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God most high, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him one tenth of everything. Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to God most high, maker of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap of anything that is yours, so that you might not say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me, Aner, Eskel, and Mamre. Let them take their share. Okay. So we get the common adventure heroic story, but most often those stories end with all of the goods and the people, specifically women that were taken and plundered and kept. Um, but the story of Abram ends a little bit differently. So what's happening here um, is a very ancient story within the book of Genesis. So linguistically, we have kind of some clues that this insertion into the writing of Genesis is a very old story. Um, and this story is going to get picked up by the New Testament it's going to get picked up by early Christians to make some connections between what's happening in this story, which we really have no idea who King Melchizedek is. We really have no idea what Salem is. Um, one idea of what Salem is, any guesses based on a larger place name that might have Jerusalem. similar letters? Yeah, Jerusalem, um, that perhaps this is a proto Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is not going to become a city within Israelite property until King David goes into Jerusalem in an attempt to kind of establish himself as a different king from King Saul. He goes and takes Jerusalem in war and establishes his capital there. So we don't have Jerusalem yet, but perhaps this is kind of a, a proto reference to Jerusalem. Um, kind of a an obscure reference in the New Testament. Does anyone know where King Melchizedek is referenced? Yeah, Robin. Yes, yes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's this verse that says that Jesus is a priest in the line or the order of Melchizedek and exactly right, not in the sense of there was a family lineage of Levites that carried the priesthood, but that Jesus functions as a priest outside of that um, in the order of Melchizedek. Um, and we'll talk about what that might mean. Hey, Jesse. 
Um, so what else do you know? We'll, we'll kind of try to tie this all together theologically, but what else do you notice that seems familiar to you? Yeah, so what are the clues that tells us this is an order document? So usually our clues are these sorts of prayers or blessings or songs often have older Hebrew words because um, linguists can study the development of Hebrew and there are certain forms, word forms that endings, that sort of thing that aren't in use later in time that would have been used before. So that's why we know the song of Miriam is probably like our oldest text in Hebrew. So that song in its original form orally was preserved and then written down and put into the Exodus text. And so that's kind of a really cool thing, I think. Um, yeah, so those are the clues that are being used. Hmm. Yeah. Kevin says a hierarchy seems a little weird here. Abram receives the first blessing and then God receives a blessing, but only for what God did for Abraham. Yeah. Um, and then we're kind of getting, or, um, I'm going to go down to these notes here because El El Yon is what is used here and here. And then Abram uses a different word here. So Melchizedek is also blessing not what Abram understands as Yahweh, his personal God, whose name he knows and calls upon, but instead kind of a general God. And so like we've talked about before, when Paul comes to the Greeks and say, you have this statue built to an unknown God. Well, actually, I know that God's name. What this text is doing is saying Melchizedek comes and gives this blessing to this most high God. And Abram is saying, hey, by the way, I've sworn my allegiance to Yahweh, who is the most high God. And so I know I've, I've discovered the name of the God you're talking about. So um, not a necessarily an answer to your question, Kevin, but more context for what Melchizedek is doing here is this general blessing. Yeah, Diane? Yeah, so it's not stipulated here as a tithe or as an order or a command yet, but we, um, we talked about with Cain and Abel that clearly there was some sense of giving as an offering or a sacrifice or possessions to God or to the gods. And Abraham is doing that as well. So there's a lot of kind of proto-religious behavior in this text. How do you name God? What does it mean to be a priest? Um, what does it look like to tithe something? You probably also noticed this. He brings out bread and wine. So we've got kind of a proto-Eucharist here. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. Right. I kind of wonder whether the people who um, believe that they're was it like, hey, I'm going to feed you? Like, hey, cool, I'm going to give you a tenth. I mean, was it to keep the peace, or was it because he was a man of God of some variety? Or it, it's always been kind of mystic. It's like there's more going on here that somebody understood, but I feel like I'm. I yeah. Um, I think you said that well, that they probably knew a lot more of what's going on than we're able to piece out. So Robin's wondering, what exactly is going on here? Why is Abram giving him a tenth of everything when he just kind of appears on the scene? He's not even from, you know, these groups of people who were attacked. Um, we don't even necessarily know where Salem is. So what exactly is going on here? Um, 
And so we can kind of just piece it out that we have, again, kind of these proto-religious rituals or practices that this person is establishing himself as a representative of the gods and what you do or the God most high. And what you do in response to that is offer up a sacrifice or an offering and thanksgiving for the victory. Um, and so Abram is giving him one tenth of everything as a way to give thanks to this God most high, while also saying like, I'm, I know a little bit about this God most high because um, I'm, I'm following this promise. So what's happening is just kind of a religious ritual of gratitude for victory in battle. Um, yeah. Jacob, are there other interpretations that this was indeed Jesus? They other usually go with stories like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but that other person was on fire was Jesus. Um, is that based on a theology that requires that Jesus as a body was always around as opposed to just spirit or I don't know? Yeah, so Shirley's saying she's heard interpretations of this text that King Melchizedek was actually Jesus or the fourth person in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was Jesus himself. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of Christian interpretation into the Hebrew text of the you know the eternal existence of Christ um, before his bodily form, just as like the spirit of God. Um, and so we've talked a lot, especially when we were reading Isaiah, that, of course, it's important to understand how this text was read by the people who heard it the first time before the concept of Jesus is even uh, talked about amongst religious persons. So we always have that. Um, so tying it back to this reference. So it's in the book of Hebrews that this mentioned Jesus, a priest in order of Melchizedek. Um, kind of the idea being that Jesus serves multiple functions, um, that Jesus is, you know, king and prophet and priest. These are the three main categories of leadership within Israel. And so the argument is that Jesus fulfills all of those functions eternally. So the role of the priest was to intercede on behalf of the people and to offer the sacrifices well jesus as the ultimate high priest is the one who gives the ultimate sacrifice of his own body eternally for all people and that is his function as a priest and so that's why the concept of jesus is read back into this the idea that jesus eternally exists even before he comes to earth in bodily form and so when king melchizedek comes and blesses abram as a way to bless the offspring of Abram, who will eventually become, you know, the people of Israel and the scene in which Jesus comes into. Um, well, that was like the prefigurement of Jesus, who is also this ultimate blessing. So that's how that's where it's coming from. But even in the New Testament, it doesn't say that he was. It does not say he was King Melchizedek. No, 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 no. So that's just a that's just an interpretation. Yeah, to, to read Jesus into the text. Um, yeah, so this is just a very interesting passage here. This figure who comes, Abram gives him a tenth of everything. There's this very religious moment to say, Abram is recognizing that the blessing is coming from God. It's not from himself. He doesn't need to hold on to riches in order for the promise to come to fruition. And so we have here at the end saying, you know, I don't want to do anything to make people think that the reason why I have what I need is because I got it from somebody else. I'm getting what I need from God. So take it. I'm not here to keep it. I don't understand. I want to say something about what the young man has eaten. He's talking about his soldiers. So those. So he had think what they already ate. How do you do that? Um, he just means that we have taken food to eat, and that's the extent of what we're going to take. Oh. Yeah. Um, and they, those men, get a little. He'll give up claiming anything for himself, but he's going to let his soldiers take some. Okay. 
not completely generous with his possessions. Um, any other questions or comments about this passage? If you are a historian of religion, trying to trace its roots and its development, you know, this is a really interesting passage on how bread and wine is going to show up in a text like this and be used for centuries, millennia, within religious rituals. Okay. All right, Genesis 15 is one of my favorite passages in all of scripture. So let's start here and we'll probably take it up more next week. Um, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. So someone who is not necessarily part of his retinue. So the land will go to someone in a different place. And Abram said, you have given me no offspring. So a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, lying each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know this for certain, that your offspring shall be aliens in a land that is not theirs, and shall be slaves there, and they shall be oppressed for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go out with to your ancestors in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, and the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Okay, um, we're not going to be able to dig into too much of this. So let's begin with one quick note and get your questions or reactions that we can then break down next week. So the very first part of this ends with he believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. So this verse is going to be picked up not only by the New Testament, but by theologians and philosophers through the centuries. So Kierkegaard's going to write a lot about this verse. What does it mean for him to be declared righteous because he believed the Lord? So what is this not saying? What is it saying? What is it not saying? Yeah, Chris. Well, it, it means that he is justified by faith. Justified by faith, yeah. I, that's a very... Um, we got some Luther there. So absolutely um, that he believed the Lord and he becomes righteous, not from his own actions, not from what he does, but because of this belief. And the Lord reckons it as righteousness, justified by faith. Exactly. It's like, you know, it's like, first of all, that, but it's hard to, that it doesn't say he's righteous. It's reckoned as righteousness. He's reckoned as just a right. Mm. Right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's like yeah, yeah, yeah. And let me look into that and bring that back next week and we can and talk about that. Um, that's a beautiful observation, this idea that it's not said he believed the Lord and Abram was righteous or God um, said he was 
it is reckoned to him as righteousness. And this, I bet it is some accounting um, terms here. The idea that on the balance, like he'll be put in the ledger as righteous, um, not because he is righteous, but because his faith reckons it to him as righteousness. The, the considerate you are counted as righteous because of your faith, not because you are, but because that mark has been put upon you. I can't even phrase it right. Yeah, the debt is wiped out. Pretend it didn't happen. Yeah. Robin? I guess that I was wondering whether God told Abraham several times that you're going to have to And this was the first time, is this correct? The first time that Abraham believed. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Like he'd been told this and he's like, okay, no. Don't see your face. And this time God said, look, look at these stars. Yeah. If you're a child, that's how you make this. Yeah, yeah. And and Abraham was like, I do want to believe. Yeah. I do want to believe. Yeah. And that, this was a turning point in this thing that they've been saying again and again. But he believed. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, third time the promise is reiterated, but the first time we're told Abram actually believes it. So Robin's saying this is the turning point here. He, he's hearing it. He's not processing. Okay, okay, sure, sure, sure. Oh, I don't see it. I don't know how, but I believe it. That's the turning point. That's how it is reckoned as righteous. Well said. Yeah. I'm just curious about what the actual words are because it says believe. And then when we talk about, you know, justification by faith, is that the same word? Is faith or belief? I mean, because you can see it as two different things. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we think you, know, you have faith in God, like you believe there is a God. Yeah. It's step one. Do you believe once you've heard about this God, do you believe what comes right out of God's mouth? Because that's kind of what it is. Yeah, absolutely. So we're I'm going to parse all of this out this coming week and let's start there and look at the actual language of this and see what else we can discover. And then we'll get into this ritual and there's a lot here in this ritual. So um, I think our appetite has been whetted for our discussion next week. So we'll come back. We'll talk about verse six. We'll talk about the ritual. So let me close this in a word of prayer. God, it is an honor to read through these stories and to see the history of people discovering who you are and attempting to believe that, that you are there, that your promises are real, and that we can have confidence in those promises. And thousands of years later, as we continue to struggle, as our faith looks like Abraham, Abram, and as we have doubt and belief all mixed together, we come to you asking for you to continue to show us the way. In Christ's name, amen. All right. See everybody in worship.